Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, good morning and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I want to welcome you to worship here at University Presbyterian Church. My name is Ken Sanu. I serve as pastor of outreach here at UPC. And I am so glad that we can be here together today to worship God. Um, thank you for joining us, whether you're here in person or joining us online or on the radio. We are glad that you are here. And if you are new here, uh, we hope that you will find a home here at UPC uh, and feel like you're part of the family because that's what you are. Our mission is to join Jesus in reconciling all people to himself. Uh, please take a moment to fill out a connect card. You'll find those in the pew parkets or um, you can go to upc.org at the bottom of the page. And we wanna help you to connect if you are new to UPC, please bring your Connect card to the welcome table, which is in the lobby area behind the sanctuary, and we have a, a small gift to give to you. A reminder that uh, there is no children's ministry today. Uh, children are welcome to uh, stay here and, 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 and be with us. Um, also, the, there is a space in the Knox Lounge in the back area if you need to uh, go and have them run around. Uh, the, the service is being um, shown on the screen there as well. And finally, uh, we are so pleased to welcome our Pastor Emeritus Earl Palmer back to UPC this morning. Um, Earl and Shirley, could you please stand? So Earl and Shirley are here, we're so glad. Um, Earl has served in pastoral ministries here at uh, UPC, uh, Union Church in Manila, First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley, uh, and the National Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. On a personal note, I've known Earl since I was a college student at Cal, and he was the senior pastor at First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley back, way back in the 80s. Um, he has a commitment to expositional preaching of biblical texts, uh, letting the biblical text speak for itself and win the respect of its, its readers. And uh, he's, a, he's the reason why I try to preach expositionally as well. Uh, Earl has a strong interest in pursuing theological themes that are present in classic and contemporary uh, literature with particular focus on such authors as C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and Karl Barth. Through his Earl Palmer Ministries, Earl frequently speaks at organizations, universities, and churches around the Seattle area and the rest of the world. And Earl has written over 20 books, and his new commentary on Ephesians has just come out, so uh, he is not slowing down at all. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship the Lord.
Oh, it's so good to see you here on this new year. And just in case some of you are wondering, uh, th there, we're aware that there's a little high-pitched noise, although it's getting softer. It's actually a problem with the organ that's kind of intermittent. We're hoping it goes away, but if it doesn't, we'll turn off the organ between things. But if you're hearing a little bit of that, just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, let's begin by singing together. You can find this in your hymnal or on the screens beside. Uh, number 156, Gentle Mary Laid Her Child. As you're able, I invite you to stand and let's sing together. Dietrich Bonhoeffer reminds us that cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Therefore, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please join me now as we confess our sins before God. Gracious God, you give strength to the weary and power to the faint. It's in you that we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts. Lord, cleanse us from all offenses that with reverent and humble hearts, we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength. Loving God, you call us together as the body of Christ to love one another, serve those in need, and proclaim the good news to all. Forgive us for ignoring your commandments and straying from your ways. Forgive us. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. So friends, believe in the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. This next hymn likens Jesus, our Savior, whose birth we still celebrate in Christmastide as a flower, a beautiful rose, 
air blooming, and it talks about prophecy that proclaimed long, long ago that Jesus would come. And then listen to these words from the third stanza we'll sing in just a moment. Jesus dispels with glorious splendor the darkness everywhere. True man, yet very God, from sin and death he saves us and lightens every load. I invite us to, sting now, sing, to stand now as we sing, Lo, How a Rose Air Blooming. It's number 163 in our hymnals. like check like to check tower and they they were pointing at a star it's a star that they see it because because a new king is born and it's Jesus so they went on three camels it has two bumps and they probably sat Man sitting like like standing outside like check like check tower and they they were pointing at a star. It's a star that they see it because because a new king is born and it's Jesus. So they went on three camels. It has two bumps and they probably sat in between the bumps because it would be more comfortable. Like. Right before they went on the camel's day, I uh, packed up frankincense, gold, and myrrh. They go to Jerusalem, and they ask, ask um, King uh, <laughs> And I forgot the, the person's name, the king's name. Oh, King Herod, sorry. Yeah, King Herod. He was kind of mad, I bet, because he didn't want any king. He didn't, 
want, he, well, he wanted a king. But there was only one king, him. I don't want a new king. Well, the God wanted them to follow the star because he wanted them to know that Jesus was born and that he was the king and not just the regular king. He was the king of everything. Yeah, King Herod told them he was didn't like the sound of it. King Herod was kind of bad. So they went back on their camels, went to the, the city. So they go to Bethlehem. And then they found a little house, and they wondered if they were wrong because it had no flags, no servants, no guards, nothing. They might say, well, is this the right place that we're supposed to be? They thought a lot of other things, but they thought that it was going to be a big castle. Because a palace is always where babies live. Anyways, they went in, and they actually found that they were right. And they find Jesus there. They give them three gifts, and it's gold, Frankenstein, and mirror. And then they gave it to the boy king. And then they realized that king, the king actually was making a trap, so they went home a different route. Like, he wanted to kill the baby? They go back. Well, it took a long, long time. They, they went through deserts and valleys and stuff. They had to travel for three weeks. Yeah. Just churches. The story of the team even made Kentucky news. I know we'll hear more about this amazing trip as students return to campus next week. As we give to God this morning, we are reminded that our financial offerings support the mission and ministry of this church. We remain committed to university students and their faith development. I know that the faith of these 20 students was tremendously encouraged by the Holy Spirit working through the generosity of Christians in Kentucky. Giving here at UPC is easy. Perhaps like me, uh, you made a commitment in 2023 to give regularly. Uh, if you haven't already, you can set that up at upc.org slash give. Or if you brought an offering this morning, you can drop it off in the silver box in the narthex, the lobby area, uh, following the service. Please join me as we pray God's blessing on our offering. Heavenly Father, on the Sunday before Epiphany, we pray that we may be like the Magi, wise enough to seek to find and know Jesus the Christ, wise enough to pay him homage, wise enough to dedicate to him our gifts of time, treasure, and talent. We bring these tithes and offerings on behalf of those who hunger, those who seek freedom and justice, those who long to see your kingdom. Help us to accomplish your purposes here at UPC, in Seattle, and around the world. We give as an act of dedication to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen.
Well, what a joy it is for me to be here uh, today in the first day of 2023. And, uh, and to have this marvelous uh, anthem and Bob Davies and Don, the brand, uh, what, a, what a beautiful thing to have uh, the principal organist and another principal piano player uh, from my era, too, to have uh, you both t together. That was so, so wonderful. I have quite, uh, you know, I have quite a history with this church, and uh, it's just wonderful coming in today. A, uh, one of the ushers, the usher on the far right, she said, oh, by the way, she said, I went to Highlanders with you. And, well, now, Highlanders was the, the high school group here in this church. I, I started uh, my ministry in this church. And in 1956, and my, my, my wife, Shirley, who's here with me today, actually came to this church in 54 because she was a student. And then, of course, uh, we got married uh, a little later uh, after I got here and I proposed to her and all. And then uh, we had a daughter, Anne, and we were here. I was the youth pastor for, for eight years uh, until 1964 when we went to the Philippines. Then we had two more children. So then we uh, left from there, went to Berkeley, and I was, that's where I met Ken Sunu at, at Berkeley and his parents and being in that great church for 21 years. And then, would you believe it, back to University Presbyterian I just couldn't stay away. Uh, it, <laughs> and... Uh, that was, again, we arrived back here in 1991. This is a little more history than you ever imagined. And uh, all the way until 2008. Can you believe it? And it was just been a marvelous, uh, a marvelous run. Then a sort of, uh, I got together with a little committee of friends from this church, and they said, you know, uh, now you're going to, you, you probably want to retire a little bit, but why don't you do like John Stott did and just sort of become a pastor at large, uh, you know, and have a ministry that way. And so I did. And that, that is uh, the ministry that I've been in. And, you know, this church has considered the ministry of Earl Palmer ministry that I've had, like John Stott had a ministry uh, after he had been at All Souls. And uh, uh, you, you've uh, treated it as a mission partnership and that's why we've had such a wonderful time being here during all these years since. And uh, I've had, had a wonderful time with the university ministry uh, small study groups that I've been able to have with them. And it's just been a joy and just a great privilege uh, to be here today. We're right in the middle of Christmas tide, and that is also a joy. Because we heard an amazing word uh, uh, was shared with the shepherds. And that is this great angel that appeared to them. And they were frightened. They were scared when they saw this angel. But the angel said, be not afraid. I bring you good news. And that's the word gospel. Appears right there in that, in that amazing moment with the, with the shepherds. I bring you good news of a great joy. That'll be all the people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And then uh, joining with them was a chorus, a, a heavenly host, a chorus that sang to them the first Christmas carol, glory to God in the highest and on earth goodwill. By the way, that's the word, good, the good decision of God, goodwill toward all people. The word anthropos is used there, toward all people. And that's the good news. Well, that good news, uh, we're in the middle of it right now because we're in Christmas tide. Uh, actually, a week from now will be Epiphany when uh, it's often called Wise Men Sunday, when the disclosure is clear of who Jesus Christ was in his baptism. And that is Epiphany. And this is now in Christmas tide when we focus on the gift of Jesus Christ himself. 
Hey, you know, uh, I chose as my text for today uh, a very favorite text of mine at the very beginning of Paul's letter to the Romans. And that is such a great, a great text because the word gospel is used in that text. The same word used by the angel describing the coming of Christ. That's good news. And the opening of Paul's letter starts with these words. He says to the Romans, he's writing to the Romans, he's never been to Rome, but he's writing his greatest book to a place where he's never been yet. He will be there. He'll be imprisoned there at the end of his career, of his life. And by the way, that's where he'll write his book of Ephesians too, <laughs> that is the, one of his other large books. But the biggest book, his most important book, was Romans. And he started it this way. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it, the righteous character of God has broken through. By the way, the word apocalypse is used there. That means it's by surprise. It has broken through. Those shepherds were surprised. The wise men were surprised. Uh, Herod was surprised too. Uh, and uh, we saw that today. But uh, <laughs> this amazing uh, surprise, the righteous character of God has broken through his faithfulness for our faith. And then Paul decides to end that opening with a, a verse of scripture, and he chooses the book of Habakkuk, and it says, for the just shall live by the faithfulness of God. That is the way he begins Romans. I love that beginning. And, you know, here's an interesting thing. When I was a student at Princeton uh, in 1955, uh, because I became the, my first ministry was to be a senior, was to be youth pastor here at University Press when L. David Cowie was the pastor, and I was the, I was a youth pastor with a high school that was Highlanders and the college group here. And when I came in 1956, before that, I was a student at Princeton Seminary. And in 1955, a very great man, a, a, Mary, a Maronite Catholic, professor of philosophy at the American University of Beirut, happened to be a, an ambassador from Lebanon to the United Nations. And during that tour of duty with the United Nations, he came to Princeton. And I had the privilege in 1955 of hearing him. And he spoke almost like St. Paul, who said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. He gave an amazing speech that became a very formative influential moment of my life and his name was Charles Malik a Lebanese Marianite Catholic professor of philosophy and he came to speak and I had the chance to hear him and here's what he said in that speech notice it almost sounds like Paul in Romans 1 never be ashamed of Jesus Christ or of his gospel this is now Charles Malick's speech. Never be ashamed of Jesus Christ or of his gospel. It is the only new thing in the world. All else is as old as the hills. Even the latest vaccine, and they had just invented the vaccine for polio, or the latest bomb, they were still experimenting with how to make nuclear weapons. Fortunately, later a treaty was signed by the nuclear countries to say that nuclear weapons should never, ever be used. But he says in 1955, all else is as old as the hills, even the latest vaccine or the latest bomb. Only the eternal, only that which is the same yesterday, today, and forever is really new. 
And then he spoke to us as pastors, and I've never forgotten his final sentence to us. And here, imagine, just a year later, I started my career as a, as a pastor, and it became a very important part of my ministry to follow his final advice. Charles Malick said to us at Princeton that day in 1955, aim, therefore, always at that which is at once eternal, universal, personal, and concrete. It almost sounds like Romans 1. And it's, but it's interesting, it's, it's sort of odd that both in Romans 1 and here in uh, Charles Malick's great speech to us in 1955, the word ashamed appears. Ashamed is a, you know, it's a, it's a caustic word. It's an unfriendly word. No one likes the word ashamed. In fact, in many cultures of the world, the worst thing that can happen is if you're shamed by somebody, disrespected by someone. It means to, it means to be embarrassed. Actually, the, one of the other meanings of ashamed is fearful or uh, uh, dis despairing or angry and ashamed. And so Charles Malick said, never be ashamed of Jesus Christ or his gospel, the good news. And then St. Paul starts Romans with, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. But by raising the word ashamed in both the beginning of Romans and in this speech by Charles Malick, he does raise with us the question, why might you be ashamed? Why might you be ashamed of something that's called good news? Because a lot of times things are called good news and you need to test them to see if they are really good news, if they uh, are the truth, if, if you can count on them, because that's, that's the dark side of a shame. I'm not sure I can count on it. I am embarrassed by it, but here is this, you're calling it good news, and therefore there's a kind of alert in the word ashamed, the way Paul uses it and the way Charles Malick used it. Never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel. That's what Paul said. Well, Take that seriously. It means that what ashamed has done to the text for us is to put us on alert to test everything we hear to see if it is true and deserves our loyalty and deserves our trust. And so that is the, you might say, that's the one good side of ashamed. I'd like to give you kind of a, a humorous illustration that, that shows this. Uh, when I was, uh, when I was the, uh, here at University Press, uh, I, I, I did skits with one of the uh, fellow pastors with me, and, and those skits uh, we would do around w at our youth meetings and uh, in various places, and it, they were, we had committed to memory the great Bud Abbott and Lou Costello comedy routine, which was one of the greatest in all of vaudeville. Who's on first? What's on second? I don't know. That's third base. That was a great comedy skit by B Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. And when in the 1980s, when our children, we now had three children when we came to Berkeley, and they were now high school kids. They were getting ready to go to college. And I felt they were a little bit deprived in not having more exposure to classic comedy. They, they, had, they had Saturday Night Live, and they had a lot of comedy exposure, but I wanted them to hear Bud Abbott and Lou Costello, and I found there was a tape, a tape of the broadcast in 1946, right at the, at the end of World War II, there was a broadcast that had 
the, the comedy hour, the Camel Cigarettes comedy hour for Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. And so I got that tape and I got my, my teenagers, my three teenagers and some of their friends, they were going to hear, hear me out and say, okay, let's see if this is really funny. And so we played it. And it's true, the Bud Abbott Lou Costello did their famous sketch and people did think it was funny. But you know, what I didn't bargain for was that that tape that I got had all of the commercials that went with the show. And this was 1946. And uh, when we got through the morning that we listened to it, the kids said, you know, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello were very funny, but the commercials were even funnier. <laughs> and I'll, I'll give you one example to show you why. Because they, they had to, they had, of course, naturally to sell a product. The product was Camel cigarettes. Um, I don't know if that's a present uh, uh, problem for salespeople now to figure out how to urge people to buy that product. But they were trying to do it in that show, and they, they did this. This is one part of that proof. There's an official, they had an official voice speaking uh, at one point and said, according to a recent nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. <laughs> the kids are kind of scratching their head. In fact, one of them was hoping to go to medical school and wonder, is this what I have ahead of me? Uh, they'll be surveying me too, to find out what cigarette I smoke. But, and then comes the, the part of their, of their, their proof now. Three leading independent research organizations asked this question of 113,597 doctors. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand name most was Camel. Now you probably enjoy rich, full flavor and cool mildness in a cigarette just as much as doctors do. And that's why if you're not a Camel smoker now, try a Camel and listen to this, on your T-zone, that's T for taste and T for throat. Your true proving ground, they're right at that point in the, in the show, your true proving ground for any cigarette. See if Camel's rich flavor of superbly blended choice tobaccos isn't extra delightful to your taste. And see if Camel's cool mildness isn't in harmony with your throat. See if you too don't say, camels suit my T-zone to a T. <laughs> this is a very friendly, uh, friendly ad, but it's all untrue. It is untrue. It's not true. So you'd be ashamed of it if you said, now that's the good news. The good news uh, from NBC this week is this. Uh, and there's been a survey done even to see if it isn't proved. Uh, doctors were asked, what cigarette do you smoke? Uh, but, you know, cigarettes uh, are not uh, good for your T-zone. Your throat, uh, that, that is a smoker's hack problem. Uh, it, or your, your lungs, that's even worse. But there is no truth in the ad. But the ad, therefore, is you're embarrassed. You're embarrassed by that ad. You're embarrassed by that. If you were to believe that as a good news, you would not trust it. So anyway, the, you think about it for a minute. When Charles Malik and Carl and, and, and Paul wrote Romans and Charles Malik's wonderful speech that he gave to us, they raised the question, don't be ashamed of the gospel. So that means they're inviting us to test whether the gospel is true. And sometimes it sounds, a, a good news sounds impressive, uh, but, it, but it, 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 it's false. And if it's false, it's not true, then you'd be ashamed of it. You should not trust it. Or secondly, what if it sounds uh, and is not necessarily wrong or false, 
but it's not significant enough. Uh, it, is, it, it is not something you can count on because it's, you call it good news, but it really isn't, it in, over the long haul, it's not significant enough. Or what if this gospel is not accessible except to a special secret circle? Now we're getting to in more dangerous territory. The gospel is called good news, but it's not accessible except for a special select circle who uh, claim a kind of maybe mysterious source of their good news. So when I join that circle, then uh, I see those outside of the circle as my enemies, and I see those inside the circle as my friends, because I have now a special kind of good news that is favoring my circle. In 1944, C.S. Lewis gave a very famous speech that he, that he called... Uh, the inner ring in which he talked about circles that you can join, that when you join that mysterious circle, uh, it gives you a kind of special strength or a special belonging. And, uh, and so he gave that speech. And then a little later, he wrote one of his last great novels about that sort of problem. Uh, that's called That Hideous Strength where a young, uh, young scholar joins a circle within a, within a college, and uh, that circle became, becomes his life, and everything depends on him being in that circle where he gets that approval. And that was the hideous strength that Lewis wrote, his last major adult novel. He had started with... Uh, out of the Silent Planet, then Paralander, and then in 1945, right at the end of World War II, he wrote That Hideous Strength. But before that, in 1944, he gave a speech that got him ready for that called, uh, the speech was called The Inner Ring. And in that, he makes this amazing, he makes this amazing comment of showing the danger of that kind of, of that kind of, good news. He says, of all passions, the passion for the inner ring, to belong to the inner ring, is the most skillful in making a man who is not yet a very bad man to do bad things. And we think of how many people have been uh, caught up in, in a ring that they join uh, or a, an advocacy that they join and feel it, it, they, they get power from it, but it becomes a very dangerous kind of belonging. So we should be ashamed of that. It's called good news because we have a good program. It's going to give more power to our political party or more power to our religion or whatever we are trying to get power for. And it, it's, it's an inner ring. And Lewis makes that very amazing comment. He says, of all the passions, the passion for the inner ring, to be in that inner ring where there is power, is the most skillful in making a man or woman who is not yet a very bad person do very bad things. And that brings us to the fourth and the worst kind of uh, danger when we... we we have a false good news, and that is the danger of toxic, uh, toxic results, results that are toxic. It was Pascal who said, men never delight in doing evil as much as if they can do it for religious reasons. And so we see how often religion can become toxic. Uh, Movements can become toxic because they, uh, they have power with that, but it is, it is a, dangerous, uh, a dangerous kind of uh, power.
very dangerous. And uh, we need a solution for it. Because the good news is about Jesus Christ and his love for us. And that's why Charles Malick said, never be ashamed of Jesus Christ or his good news. The cure is a greater, is a greater truth, a greater good news that we can then, uh, we can belong to and trust. And it, gi it gives us uh, an answer to uh, the foolishness of, the, of, a, of an ad that says, uh, what, what cigarette do you smoke? But cigarettes are not good for your T-zone. They're bad. It gives you the clarity to be able to analyze something on the basis of truth. And also, uh, it, it can be the cure for where we stumble or become a part of an inner ring that is doing actual harm. And so, uh, the gospel that we're told to trust why should we trust the good news of Jesus Christ? Well, St. Paul calls it in Ephesians the belt that holds everything together. He calls the, and when he talks about the whole armor of God, he says that he starts with the belt of truth. Truth holds us together. And so the gospel is true. And that truth is holding us together. Uh, the gospel is also universal. The gospel invites us, invites all people to discover the good news of Jesus Christ. It's in, in that sense, it's, it's not tribal. It's not dependent on a circle. The problem with circles is that you begin to you begin to look at those outside your circle as your enemy. But the gospel is universal. And J Jesus Christ is the one who heals that uh, the badness of, of a circle that goes bad. Uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, one of the very interesting uh, one of the very interesting places where Jesus takes on error, takes on things that are happening that are wrong in our lives, where they become toxic, is in the fifth chapter, at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, our Lord says, you have heard that it is said, you shall love your neighbor, that's good, right, and hate your enemy. But that's nowhere in the Old Testament. It's, it is in the Dead Sea Scrolls that you should hate foreigners and hate people that, that are not in your tribe or not in your circle. But <clears throat> our Lord then takes that on and says, you've heard it said <clears throat> that you shall love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you. And that will show that you are... A child of your father in heaven that will show that you're in that you're in his uh, universal family so it'll give you a true and a universal uh, uh, belonging non-tribal but universal and the gospel is strong Jesus Christ is able to uh, heal that badness or to heal that time when, we, when things go awry, uh, even bad religious instincts that Pascal was worried about. He's able to heal those for us. In, in, in the book of Romans, in this very book of Romans, Paul will, will put it this way, when he gets to the 12th chapter of Romans, he will say, uh, he says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, 
Leave room for the wrath of God. Let God be the judge because vengeance belongs to him. No, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Some people think that burning coals meant judgment. No, it means help because in a Bedouin society, if you need a campfire and you don't have a fire, uh, you can borrow coals from your neighbor. And that's what the book of Proverbs means when it says that's the coals of fire that you can give to someone so they can start their fire. It will give coals. So do not be, and then St. Paul ends that line with this, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There is a goodness that is stronger than evil. You know, today we read of the death of Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, the great. Uh, he was the Holy Father, uh, the, the, the pontiff who retired, and to, and today he died. Uh, I was really, I was really taken by Benedict the Sixteenth, especially when his very first encyclical. You know, when a pope writes an encyclical. It's known by the, the first three letters or the first three words in the encyclical. And his very first encyclical, Benedict XVI, was Charitas est Deus. God is love. And in that wonderful uh, encyclical, Benedict said, love is not a theory. Love is not an idea. It's an event that happens. And that event is Jesus Christ himself. The same yesterday, today, and forever. But Jesus Christ is that love. It's what he does in our behalf. And I, I loved that, that encyclical. And he, in the very opening lines of the encyclical, he says, is love an idea? Or is it an event that happened? It's an event that happened when Jesus Christ identified with us and forgave our sins and healed us. And so do you need a gospel that is universal? We need a gospel that's true. We need a gospel that is strong and able to do that. And finally, best of all, we need the gospel that is good. It is good. Uh, it has a, that is the deep meaning of the word salvation that Paul uses in, Roman, in Romans 16, 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. Salvation, that means safety, for the safety that comes in knowing that Jesus Christ is alive, that his love is there, that he's able to heal us and make us whole. And that safety, that salvation, that's eternal and it's new. Charles Malick said it's the newest thing in the world. And I love a line from G.K. Chesterton who was saying in, in one of his uh, books, he said, we have sinned and grown old. Our father is younger than we are. His, he has the appetite for newness and that newness is the newness of the gospel and he makes things new and he's able to heal and forgive and make it new so uh, they said they were not ashamed and by erasing that word they asked us to think through what is the good news are we following a good news that is toxic or dangerous, or are we following a good news that is healing and whole and good? And uh, Benedict the Sixteenth said it right when he said, "God is love. He is the author of love, and that love is an event that happened in Jesus Christ Himself. That's what we celebrate on at Christmas. That's what's disclosed." Uh, 
in Epiphany. And that's what's made for us in Pentecost. Ours, we get to have it too. For everyone, we can have it. We can have this universal, true, strong, and good beginning to a new year. Heavenly Father, thank you for this uh, amazing text and that it's ours and we can claim it and we can enjoy it and we can realize that it's eternal, it's personal, and it's good. It's wonderfully good. It doesn't exclude others. It invites us all to discover that love. And Lord, we thank you that Jesus is our teacher. And he's the one who is able to heal the brokenness that sometimes seals us up in, in circles we should not be sealed up in and then gives us the freedom to share that good news with those around us. We thank you for that. In Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Well, Earl has reminded us that God is the, indeed the source of all truth, that his gospel is not only good news, but it's good news because it's true. If it were false, it would not be good at all. And so how good to know that God is not only the source of all truth, but the source of all love as well. And our next hymn is celebrating that. In fact, it's a prayer to God, thanking him for his indeed love divine that excels all other loves. So I invite us to stand as we sing together. It's number 558, we'll sing the first, third, and fourth stanzas. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the dawn of a new year. Thank you for Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Thank you for the gospel that is true and good 
eternal, universal, personal, and concrete. We thank you that you bless us with new mercies every day. We thank you for your faithful presence. Grant us humble hearts that we may be prepared to serve you. Through ministries of compassion and service, may we always reflect your love. Fill our emptiness with Jesus. Help us to turn towards you and become one with your love and grace, especially when we're faced with life's hardships. Grant us the strength to not only change our behavior, but also our attitude. Show us how to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. Lord, on this Sunday before Epiphany, we pray that you would offer us, as you offered the Magi, direction, purpose, and a goal for which to strive. Help us to emulate Jesus, to love as Jesus loved, to serve as Jesus served, and to be salt and light in the world through what we say and do. Everywhere we see reminders of human suffering. We're overwhelmed by the amount of pain in the world. We grieve for the continuing war in Ukraine. And we thank you for our mission partner, Pam, in Turkey, and for the church's work among Ukrainian refugees in that country. We also grieve for the many children who go to bed hungry, for the poverty and violence in our midst. We're surrounded by affliction, poverty, racism, intolerance, and hatred. Lord, your unconditional love calls for us to be loving, welcoming, and hospitable to all of our neighbors. Pour into our hearts your compassion. Strengthen and guide us as we go forth and make your kingdom tangible and surround us with your presence. Thank you for our UPC mission partners in Kenya, for Francis Amundi, Gideon Ochieng, and Marta Bennett. We're grateful that you have brought them through a challenging year, and we pray that you would strengthen and encourage them for this coming year. Thank you for our university students and staff who spent Christmas break on mission in Kentucky. We also lift up to you those in our congregation who are facing challenges and pray for your intervention and healing. Lord, draw us closer to Christ and keep us faithful in ministry as we seek to share his love and grace. We lift our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to invite us once more to stand and sing together hymn number 168, On Christmas Night All Christians Sing. <laughs> Oh, 
Pastor Emeritus Earl Palmer once again for preaching the word to us today. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, our prayer team to come forward. Uh, if you would like someone to pray with after the service, um, our prayer teams will be up in front and you can come down and meet them. Um, we do have coffee and cocoa upstairs in Geneva Hall this morning, but, but no snacks today, so just be known. Uh, and we invite you to stop by the welcome table in the narthex for information um, on how to get more connected here at UPC. And as always, we uh, are so grateful for your continued support to keep our church strong. And now Pastor Earl will uh, give us the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Father, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all in this new year. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.